and their communication skills better and better. For Parasaurolophus, a female's concern during the breeding season would mostly be checking out the guys. That is, finding which ones seem to be the healthiest and therefore were potentially the best fathers of the next generation. Evolution perfects not only Parasaurolophus' ability to make sounds, it also selects for genes that improve the ability to hear and interpret those sounds. Various male Parasaurolophus would presumably be making very loud, very raucous calls of a very particular sort. And the female Parasaurolophus would be judging the quality of that call, probably its sound, which may have represented how healthy the individual was, and its ability to be precise in terms of generating that sound, because it showed that was a creature with a healthy mind, with all the proper genes for a good Parasaurolophus. Males with the largest crests can produce the richest and lowest frequencies, sounds that can travel for miles. Those same low frequency calls become highly attractive to females. We would have different Parasaurolophus competing with each other um, with these sound calls, and the females probably calling on occasion to say, hey baby, that sounds really good. You're the one for me. For Parasaurolophus, genetic modifications over time give them the tools both to pick up and emit low frequency sounds. In fact, over time, they evolved the ability to send and receive extremely low frequency vibrations called infrasound. Each species seems to have had its own note or series of notes. And you can have up to five different species of duckbill living in one place at one time. So in the breeding season, you'd hear five different uh, orchestras, five different ranges of courtship notes. And you'd feel them through your feet, too, as they go into those really deep notes. But Parasaurophilus is the exception, not the rule. For most females of the Cretaceous, finding a mate who's stronger, smarter, and packs more advanced killing tools than the next guy is crucial. But there's more. For a T-Rex male, surviving to adulthood most likely means he's had some good parenting himself. No doubt, he's also developed some strong hunting skills and probably even learned to duck when Quetzalcoatlus swooped down and tried to steal him as a chick. In other words, you don't make it this far without some good genes to pass down. But evolution isn't just about mating. It's also about ensuring those valuable eggs actually hatch and grow up. the prehistoric world of the Cretaceous. Here roam creatures from the outrageously large to the outlandishly terrifying and the incredibly bizarre. But every dinosaur, no matter how radical, is hatched from an egg. And like the well-engineered bodies they will eventually grow into, evolution has created some of the most advanced eggs history has ever seen. An egg is like a space capsule. Everything that the embryo is going to need is pretty much in there. And evolution took care of something else. The shell of a dinosaur egg is built like a motorcycle helmet, able to withstand a severe shock. And then, for even more protection, there's the albumin, or egg white. The egg white is kind of a gel and has multiple functions. One is to keep the embryo that's developing moist, but also acts as a shock absorber because if the egg gets jarred, you don't wanna, you don't wanna kill the embryo that's developing by a sudden shock. A well-constructed egg makes it that much more likely that a hatchling will survive. And when that youngster grows up, it will pass on those very same genetic traits that saved it in the first weeks of life. Inside this tiny home, a single fertilized cell divides rapidly. These cells become a myriad of tissue types that will make up bones, skin, nerves, and organs. 
Dividing cells also form brains, senses, and weaponry needed to protect this dinosaur as it grows up. At this embryonic stage, tiny genetic differences, changes that might only affect one in a billion traits, make the difference between a hatchling that survives and one that's chomped, stepped on, or even starves to death. To be able to actually see a baby T-Rex hatching would be something akin to the excitement you would get by going into space, you know? So, I mean, I probably would get maybe just a little more money to go into space than I would to see a T-Rex hatching, but not much more. The age of dinosaurs is an era of sophisticated biodiversity. Diversity that proves one thing. Evolution creates not just one, but many strategies for survival. Yet for one creature, that strategy seems almost cruel. Over her lifetime, a female Sora Poseidon produces thousands of eggs, yet only two or three survive to adulthood. So what that tells us is that many, many, almost all of the offspring are being killed and eaten by predators. Losing virtually all of your offspring to carnivores sounds like an evolutionary nightmare. But in fact, it's just the opposite. That one survivor, that one in 3,000, may just possess the single trait, giving it the ability to make a quick escape as its siblings are eaten. Or it might inherit a genetic combination that allows it to grow stronger, bigger, and maybe even just a tiny bit faster. The sauropods are probably digging these nests, probably kicking out a little hole with the hind foot, squatting down, depositing a few eggs, maybe five or six, maybe a dozen, covering them up, and then just walking away, forgetting about them. For months, sauropocyton eggs are left unguarded, warmed and protected by nothing more than dirt and rotting vegetation. The nests become killing fields. So I'm sure that many, many sauropod nests were found and destroyed by predators before the babies could even hatch them. Yet with so much stacked against them, Sora Poseidon thrive for 15 million years. They're an evolutionary success story. But some scientists believe they could have achieved even more. If I was going to engineer a super sauropod, I'd give it a bigger brain because it would be a negligible investment. We're talking about a few more pounds on an animal that already weighs 40 or 50 tons. But if it was smarter, then it could practice more extensive parental care. The babies themselves could be smarter. It could put fewer resources into reproduction and more resources into growing larger. Growing larger when you already weigh 50 tons sounds impossible, but it isn't. If I wanted to grow a 200-ton sauropod, that's where I'd start, with about seven more pounds of brain. No land animal ever grew to 200 tons, but evolution did keep dinosaurs going for 165 million years. They adapt to a world of tremendous geologic change and soaring global temperatures, a world where little stays the same. But then comes catastrophe from the sky. A meteorite strikes the Earth. After the great dinosaur die-off, these huge and magnificent creatures seemingly cease to exist. But things are not always as they appear. Maybe dinosaurs are still here. Maybe they're still all around us. It turns out clues are everywhere. A sauroposidon could raise its massive head over 60 feet into the air. But this was only possible because their neck bones were so light, almost 85% hollow. The neck vertebrae of sauroposidon are four and a half feet long, but they were almost all air. A T-Rex grew to seven tons in weight as big as a killer whale. Yet like Sora Poseidon, its bones were honeycombed with empty spaces. And there's another clue. The lungs of Deinonychus, T. 
T-Rex, and Sauroposite are designed like those of a living thing we see all around us every day. We look at the respiratory system, it's not like those of mammals at all. It's like something much smaller, much more delicate, like birds. Graceful, soaring on the breeze. One of the best adapted and most common creatures to inhabit the Earth. Birds are almost certainly descended from the mighty dinosaur. Everybody knows that birds have hollow bones, and a lot of people think that's an adaptation for flight. What not a lot of people realize is that birds inherited their hollow, air-filled bones from their dinosaurian ancestors. All around the world, birds, like dinosaurs, fill just about every niche in every environment, from the rainforest to the mountains to the seacoast. An ostrich at nine feet tall and over 300 pounds is the largest modern bird. That may pale in comparison to a Tyrannosaurus rex or the giant Sauropocyte. But the biodesigns, which give birds their ability to get up in the air, to maneuver in flight, and to reproduce, are clearly found in dinosaurs. Genetic traits that once allowed dinosaurs to grow to mammoth proportions, or survive in a world of brutal killers, Features honed by 165 million years of evolution simply never went away. Tools that once served dinosaurs so well have adapted to serve new functions in modern birds. Dinosaurs used hollow bones to grow very large. Birds used them to save weight. Dinosaurs used air sacs to move air along their massive necks. Birds use air sacs to stay aloft for long periods. It turns out that in many ways, the only difference between dinosaurs and birds is scale. And there's even evidence that many terrestrial dinosaurs nearly had what it takes to fly. In fact, the arms and hands of Deinonychus work remarkably like a bird's wings. For Deinonychus, this high-speed motion creates a grasping claw able to dig deep into flesh. In a bird, this same bone allows its wings to flap at those same high speeds, the key to flight. Deinonychus arms were very specialized, much like modern birds. In fact, like a modern bird, they have the ability to fold their arms, or their wings, if you will, to the side. This is the same folding ability that allows birds to fly today. The wings of a bird in flight are a living example of Deinonychus's claw in action. Look at a bird out in nature as it's moving its wings back and forth. The pattern of the joints and the angle of the joints in the wings of birds closely match the pattern we see in Deinonychus. And there's one final clue, a clue that all but definitively connects birds and dinosaurs. And it's something you'd least expect, something scientists call the furcula. We call it a wishbone. Wishbones today only exist in birds, yet virtually every one of the most ferocious carnivorous dinosaurs had one. In the end, the evidence points to one single conclusion. The mighty T-Rex, the wily Deinonychus, the graceful Quetzalcoatlus, the giant Sauropocyte. All were just supersized birds. So next time you sit down, ready to carve that Thanksgiving turkey. Just imagine what that bird's great, 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 great grandparents 